Hello and welcome back to the show. I'm your host, Rebecca Larson, and today I am joined once again by my dear friend, Dr. Emma. Emma, welcome back. Hi, Rebecca. How has your weekend been? Oh, wonderful. We had some beautiful weather here in Minnesota, didn't we? Mm-hmm. It was now we're gonna make jealous, everyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Today it's a little bit chilly though. Fall is here. Yes. Well, the, the first day of fall was yesterday. Mm-hmm. Oh well, you know, the transition. Yeah. Um, we definitely felt it here. That's what is very beautiful about Minnesota. We have the four seasons. Um, so I thought that was kind of nice in a way, you know. It is. It's been quite hot this summer, and it's been quite hot this month, too, here in Minnesota. So I think everybody needs to just enjoy the beginning of fall and yeah. go for walks. That's Get our sweatshirts. Doing. Wear sweatshirt yeah. jeans. Sweater yeah. weather. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we're all ready to get them out of the closet. We can go without the snow, but let's just. Yes, yes. No yeah. snow for a little while, please. Yes. We want a white Christmas, but not just quite yet. Right. Yeah, we have some time. Let's not rush it, please. Uh, no, please. No, no. Let's let's make it a Halloween without any snow. <laughs> I feel like I, I'm trying to find a transition here into the topic, but Halloween doesn't quite work on the topic. That we're going right, on. right, right. Well, maybe. <laughs> Go dressed as a as one of the artists of Henry VIII's court. That's right. Well, everybody cause... would would ask you about it, and then you could just give them some information, very valuable information. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. I thought I thought of you yesterday, and this is just a little sidetrack here. I stopped at the gas station yesterday to fill up my car, and I went inside and got myself a soft drink and a Twix bar because I love me some chocolate. <laughs> and I was at the register, and the young man behind the register said, "Would you like?" to play a trivia game with me today and I was like yeah (laughs) of course I do because I love trivia and he started talking about the Minnesota Institute of Art and he yeah I thought of you immediately and he said something and he totally lost me because he started talking about French painters and he asked me something in regards to what French painting is housed at the Minnesota Institute of Art and I looked at him with a blank stare and I was like I wish my friend Dr. Emma was here because she would know the answer to this <laughs> so which which French painting yeah it was some iconic one or something there's, there's several they have very good Monet's they have very good Renoir's they mm-hmm. have a very good section on French um, art uh, impressionists and all the kind of French art we love uh, it's very close to all the Van Gogh's and mm-hmm. Gauguin's and all that area too and recently, in that same area, they bought us a very big Spanish painting by one of my favorite uh, painters in the in the world, um, Sorolla, mm. who was from Valencia. And um, Sorolla was a painter who really worked on light and to depict people. For example, his very famous his paintings of children in the beach and women with very airy white dresses. I'm sure you've seen those. Where you yeah, see the, yeah, those always, they're so iconic because it's just the beautiful, bright scene in the beach with children playing on the beach and these women in these beautiful white gowns. Um, and Soraya was very, very well known also for his portraits. So he painted a lot of the people uh, in high society, 19th century Spain, and with a lot of, uh, very close to reality, a lot of verisimilitude and realism, going back to terms about quality in art. So he reminds me a bit in a way of Holbein, because mm. when a, a painter achieves that, puts a face to the people over time, it also contributes to his um, memory, right, as a great painter, because mm. people are like, yeah, you painted that famous painting of so-and-so. So, yeah, Soroya is wonderful. I encourage you to in actually the house where you lived in Madrid is it's a museum. So whenever you are in Madrid, you have to go and check out this place. We've got, it's got a wonderful garden before you go in and it's in the city center, really. Uh, mm-hmm. But it's it's a little property that, you know, one of these little properties that are in the in a, it's like a little haven in the center of a huge, uh, beautiful city. Um, so, so yeah, yeah. Yeah, you that painting in that new when I went that day to the Mia and I saw that new painting by Soroya and they've bought a few Spanish paintings lately that have made me really happy. So I, I go there often. Um 
I, I was just imagine that you always go, oh, I'm going to go and see Van Gogh because, you know, people like me do things like that. Yeah. I just go into I'm going to go and have a little um, look into the French uh, area and all that and, and then see a bit of Van Gogh who, you know, is from that place we were talking about, Flanders, really. So he's he's the he's the he, this is the 18th century. This is when when art changes no, so much. But but he really is a. Uh, uh, representative of, of that um, territory in Europe that that has so much art and, and so many artistic revolutions. And I mm -hmm. just walk in this room and I see this new painting by one of my favorite Spanish painters and it's huge. So, you know, that's exciting when you're an art historian mm -hmm. and you get to experience things like that. That's the magic of, of places like the Mia. Um, yeah. If you are in Minnesota, I encourage you to go. It's a beautiful place. Um, and the good thing about the Mia is that it's a it, well, it's one of the leading museums in in the United States for for Italian art for Flemish art that we were talking. So if we ever want to go and see actually uh, quality art in Minnesota, we have to go there. Yeah, and you and I, time. you and I will go there sometime together. Yeah, yeah, and then but then they've got from so it's one of these encyclopedic museums. So they also have lots of art from other cult cultures, times, and 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 places. So. Um, it's just a good place to to teach people about how art has influenced human human beings and how it's shaped our way to understand our surroundings, really, which is yeah. what art is trying to do, emulate art, explain nature, just express our that part of us that we're not really sure that is like human, but like something else, right? That that kind of expression of of something higher if you want to say it in a way yeah. I'm a bit philosophical here yeah maybe. yeah well I thought of you yesterday <laughs> well <laughs> well next time um yeah you do get those once in a while those favorite questions I got yeah I excited I got the day that it was a two to one at the I think it was when I was getting a coffee somewhere and you get like five cents off if you got it right oh all those five cents that I got after I answered that question Felt so good quicker than I wanted to because they were all shocked and a bit amused they were like oh we know what you are <laughs> yeah you you just came out of the library just to, to have this coffee we know what you are <laughs> right? i was so hoping he was gonna ask me like a tutor artist question right. and then it came right. out some french and i was like nope he lost me <laughs> I'm, oh, so, I'm, well. I'm out and it was a name that i didn't even recognize i had never heard before i couldn't even tell you what it was but right, right. today we're gonna talk about a name that i have heard before and we've been yes. on on this track of catherine of aragon with you for quite some time and we who's kinda, that i don't know never she, heard of that lady ever in my life she may have been one of the wives of henry the oh, eighth that maybe, man we might say maybe one of the best wives after all the talking that uh you've done Certainly the, fact, the first yes and the longest the longest the first uh the one who actually served as an international ambassador so the one who had an international role you can mm. say the other five had did great things, and they did. But, I mean, Casimir Aragon was really the one who put England in the European map in the first, especially the second decade of the 16th century. This is the time we're going to talk about. So, mm. yes, yes, famous lady. Yeah. <laughs> so today we want to kind of keep on the art trajectory that we've been on um with England and I'm not even going to try his name but I'm going to say today we're going to talk about Peter I'm going to call him Peter the guy who punched Michelangelo in the nose <laughs> okay Pietro Peter Pietro Torrigiano was an artist from um Florence um and that's why he has a complicated name and yes he, he he's very well known in in the artistic world obviously because he belongs to a very select group of artists, really. This is, if if we're talking about the Renaissance, these are the, this is the group of people that basically put it into motion in terms of the visual arts, because he was training in, with Michelangelo, at the, with the Medici, and we've all heard of the Medici, uh, which are another iconic, uh, it's another iconic name from the time, and they had relations with the Tudors, obviously. Uh, but it's not through the Medici that Torrigiano, this artist, comes to England, really. And this is at the core of what I do. 
when we study the Renaissance in England, the tendency has been to think that everything comes from Italy, which is a safe statement because the Renaissance started in Italy. And, and I mean, if you have a guy called Pietro Torrigiano that suddenly appears in the English royal accounts, what are you going to think? You're going to think he's coming from Italy, right? Yeah. But at this time, Italy was not like England. Italy was fractioned, was was a, were city-states, were kingdoms. It wasn't like England is a kingdom. Uh, uh, Italy's pretty fractured. And in the in the area of Florence is the Medici who are really influential. And then these Medici are great patrons of the art. And because Italy has all this art from antiquity that they can replicate, for generations there were artists that were trying to bring back these by looking at these sculptures from antiquity, from ancient Rome, uh, especially because the Romans had copied from a lot from the Greeks, right? A lot of these. And these are the models that these artists like Torrigiano and Michelangelo are using to try to bring this back in a new way. They they knew that in antiquity there had been great painters because the people who had wrote about art in antiquity told told us about it. But painting is is fragile, it's not like other things and, and most of it was lost. We don't really have, but we do have stories about great encounters between uh, painters and, 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 and rulers and painting portraits of rulers. And really in the Renaissance, there is not only this reception of Renaissance, these ideas is also linked to the idea that the individual is starting to take the central um, stage. Um, and in the, in the case of the rulers, this is very well exemplified in the appearance of all these portraits that we love and that we can make a connection with. So Torrigiano is really someone who brings that, but he doesn't bring it through Italy because he has like many Renaissance artists, he has a life that, oh my goodness, this guy goes everywhere. So artists, we think about them now as artists, but at the time they were just really people that were getting formed in the arts, but that were often um, soldiers too. So Torrigiano fought several wars before he became uh, sculpture to Henry the Eighth. Oh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, like for example, uh, we've all um, heard of the famous William Shakespeare in in the Spanish language. We have the famous Miguel de Cervantes, who wrote El Quixote, the most famous um, book written in Spanish. He fought uh, for the Spanish for the Spanish monarchy too. He was a soldier. So these people were often more often than not soldiers. Um, so after Torrigiano um, is in this ideal place learning with uh, Michelangelo, but he can't really take that Michelangelo is better than him <laughs> and breaks his nose that we've talked about before, right? Yeah. Because they're competing who, to see who's the best one. And Michelangelo is just loved by uh, everyone. I just imagine um, um, Torrigiano gave other signs that he had a very like mm, bad temper. Like he was quick to anger, right? Because we'll talk about we know, why we know that. Um, so this is really, excuse me, I had to drink a little water. This is really a story about two artists that are competing and one has to leave because he can't take the, the other ones better. And then um, Torrigiano leaves Italy, but comes back. He he comes back when he's already working for Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon to try to recruit other artists to take them to England. So this influence that Catherine of Aragon has um, is larger than just bringing Torrigiano. It's bringing an art that once that Henry VIII has seen, he can't get enough of it. And once the Cardinal Woolsey has seen it, he can't get enough of it. And there's other Italian artists as well as Torrigiano, Giovanni Damagiano, others that, another easy name, <laughs> Giovanni. <laughs> La Magliano is another Italian artist that works for Cardinal Woolsey. We've all seen his roundels in the Hampton Court. Mm. You remember those big roundels with emperor, Roman emperors? See how these ideas about uh, bringing back antiquity? Yeah. On a pretty medieval uh, looking castle, really, because um, Hampton Court has those elements. That happens in Spain, too. That kind of like those 
medieval areas are starting to get a Renaissance touch. These roundels here, this new chapel gets a new tomb, but this tomb is going to be in the Renaissance style. So it's the most innovative tomb in England. And that's why Henry VIII brings Torrigiano to England, but he really comes to work first for Catherine of Aragon. And how he ends up coming to work for Catherine of Aragon? Because he's been in the court of Margaret of Austria. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Margaret of Austria, who is in Flanders. So let's 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 recap that. An Italian artist that has to leave Italy because he's competing with someone who's just everybody loves and is the best. So he goes and fights some wars, you know, to get a bit of that toxic energy out. And then he goes to the court of Margaret of Austria, where we know. And this is his connection where it starts to the whole Tudor thing. We know that from Margaret of Austria, he repaired a bust of Mary Rose Tudor when mm -hmm. she was betrothed to Charles V. Well, it is highly likely that this bust still survives. It is in Harvard, in the Harvard Museum, uh, the art museum they have in Harvard uh, University. So she pays him to repair it because this is made in a medium. A medium is a way to make art. So, for example, terracotta, uh, clay. He, it's made in a medium that he's an expert in. But it means that probably he made the original too and he was just repairing an original he had made because he was well known for this. So Margaret probably entrusted him to do this in the first place. Makes sense. <clears throat> and when he does that is when... All of a sudden, but not all of a sudden, he appears in England in January of 1511, making pomegranates out of clay and painting those with other artists for the epiphany when Prince Henry has been born. Prince mm -hmm. Henry Tudor, the son of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. Guess who was the godmother of Prince Henry? Mm -hmm. Who? Hmm. <laughs> it was Margaret of Austria. <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> Auntie Figure Margaret. Figure that one out. Wow. We're going to call what her What do you Auntie. think? There's a connection there, maybe? Yeah. So why we know it's Torrigiano? It doesn't mention Torrigiano. It says aprons for the painters and this and this describes a lot of the colors and this and everything. Why do we know it's him? Because this medium, this clay has never been used in England before. And why do we know, why do we know this is connected also to Catherine of Aragon? Well, first of all, because it was for a representation, so probably a nativity scene that was um, that was um, displayed in the Queen's chamber. And guess who was in charge of all of this? Uh, Sir Henry Guilford, a.k.a. Fun Guy. Mr. Fun Guy. <laughs> Mr. Fun Guy prepared a little nativity scene for the baby to be to see because the epiphany was such an important um feast in the spanish court this is all linked to that idea that really he's an english prince but his spanish heritage is extremely important to his mother and she's going to bring an artist like torrigiano to do something like this because in spain italian sculptures were also favored so she's introducing a type of art that is more of her taste, more of a taste that she had acquired in Spain in the court of her mother and her father. Because she wants, not because she wants to, wants to change England, because she wants to introduce those things to, to strengthen the bonds between Spain and England at the time. Right. And then, obviously, Henry VIII must have seen this, saw Torrellano and said, oh yeah, baby, you're going to carve the tomb, first of my grandmother, then of my father and mother. And these tombs that are in the Lady Chapel in Westminster Abbey, they're just simply wonderful. Yes, they not are. Only, yes, they're not only innovative in terms of the style, because in there in the Renaissance style, it's just the way they are displayed in the place. Yeah, so I just got, I got goosebumps thinking about it yes. because of how they do look. Yeah. Oh, what was your favorite part? Was it to me was a feeling of entering that space and like seeing the, the impact of the sculpture 
inside of the architecture, inside of the space, right? That magnificence that it yeah. transmits to you, that message of power, really, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, that's probably the best way to describe it. I just remember being in awe of it when I saw it in person. Like you just, you're speechless when you look at it. Well, that's got a that's got a translation in artistic t- terms. It's called a Stendhal moment. Oh. Stendhal <clears throat> was a... a person who wrote about his experience when when he went to see all this magnificent art in um in Italy his this experience that you have sometimes when you see very beautiful art that you just become emotional and it just takes over you control of you you just have like a rush of adrenaline or the, for everybody's different that's a standalone moment that's that's when you are experiencing that beauty and the Really, it's getting the message through, really, isn't it? Because what you think when you walk into the Lady Chapel and you see the tomb of Henry the Seventh and the Elizabeth of York, let's remember that was carved in the in the very early reign of Henry the Eighth and Catherine of Aragon by Torrigiano. Um, when you go walk in there, you think these people were powerful, and it's it's both of them. It's a way to represent that they are founders of the Tudor dynasty, really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And they look just like they do in the portraits, pretty much. Like you look, you think of the portraits and then you see their tombs and you go, whoa, that's Margaret Beaufort. That's just like I always imagined her to look. Why do you think that is, Rebecca? Because he was very talented. That's why. Well, because by the time Torrigiano was working for Henry VIII, and Catherine Vargon, they had portraits of Henry the Seventh, sure. and the the king's grandmother, and the king's mother. So he's using these. He's using these portraits because he never met them. Let's remember, right. Margaret had died in, for example, Elizabeth had died in in, uh, in childbirth, uh, yeah. way way before Torrigiano ever made it to England. So uh, this is building on the memory of those portraits and their also their funerary masks because in England that was a thing too so those are used too he used all of these things and I'm sure they talked about it and I'm sure they had conversations and Henry participated and Catherine what is very very important to know about that is that despite the fact that it's it's almost a continuation of something that there was in England it's got many many elements of late gothic architecture and the way to transmit that in spanish and castilian architecture especially in places like some some place that had been made before this place um this this display of this tomb here with the with the renaissance style in the in the chapel of the condestables de castilla in burgos burgos that place that we've talked about so many times in the cathedral in burgos And the biggest manifestation of this in the Spanish uh, monarchy will be in the Capilla Real, where Isabel and Fernando, the Catholic monarchs, Catherine's parents, were buried in Granada. That amazing uh, Capilla Real, that that is the most outstanding example where Juana I and Philip Philip of Habsburg, because, you know, sometimes in Spain they still call him Philip the, the Handsome, and I'm like, I don't call him that. I, don't, I never met the guy. I don't know if he was handsome. He doesn't look, by by the looks of his portraits, he doesn't look very handsome to me. <laughs> They're also buried there. But the most important thing to know is that at the same time that Torrigiano was carving this for Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon, Domenico Fancelli, who was also an Italian by the name of him, <laughs> was carving the tomb of Catherine's brother, Juan IV Ferdinand of Aragon. And it has so many similarities oh. to the one of uh Henry the Seventh and Elizabeth of York. Okay. In Avila in in Castile. Can I ask you a question? Yeah. I know I just saw these tombs briefly when I was in England and they're brass, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. So Torrigiano, that's uh-huh. the best that's the best I can do with his name. That was pretty good. <laughs> 
Thanks, thanks. Okay. You just so- have to roll your R's or a, 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 a little bit more. <laughs> okay. Good. I'll practice. I can roll my R's, but don't ask me to go, do go it. Go for it. Go do it once. Try it once. <laughs> Tori, Tori, nope. Can't do it. Tori, to, you nope. did. You were there. Yeah. Were there. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> I'm just embarrassing myself now. No, okay. So if he sculpted, or I don't know what you would call this, created mm-hmm. these effigies of their tombs, mm-hmm. was it then covered in brass? How did that work exactly? Oh, you can sculpt that. in many mediums. You can sculpt in many. So he was known for doing clay and for the, and and we have a sculpture of Henry the Seventh done by Torriano in clay in the terracotta, right? Yes. Um, and there's many others. There's many want to be maybe Sir Henry Guilford, fun guy. <laughs> um, there's there's many others, but sculptures and Torriano Renaissance artists worked in many mediums because we. Because he became known for be, for sculpting clay, we all always think of him for doing those. But um, he could, he he did that. He sculpted those in in gilt. Uh, so in in so they are everything that you see there was sculpted by him. It's just the medium is different, and he did he did portraits and he painted portraits. He painted a portrait of Isabella of Portugal, Charles V's wife, after he left England because Torrigiano leaves England. Wow. We can talk about that. He was very talented. Yeah, he had a fight with Michelangelo, remember? <laughs> I do. Because he was almost as good as him. <laughs> I, it does seem like he could do anything. He really could. Well, if he was competing with Michelangelo, he could do everything. Yes, yes. That's the, And that was another goal of the Renaissance artist, to do everything, to be the ultimate man. To mm. be able, like, let's le, let's think about Leonardo da Vinci, right? Another Italian. Oh, it's just about Italians today. Yeah. Uh, maybe we have to do a, a, to, a Tudor tour in Italy, Rebecca. <laughs> oh, here we go. I just want an excuse to go back to Italy. So be- beautiful. So um, Leonardo da Vinci was designing uh, engineering, really, in many ways and respects, these machines. So uh, mathematicians worked with artists. We know that uh, Nicolas Kratzer, who was a, who was a German... Um, astronomer worked with Hans Holbein uh, to do the ceiling at the Greenwich festivities in 1527 because it was planets and like they wanted it to be accurate. So the Renaissance uh, people were more in tune between the arts and and technic and technical things that we that we think. So all these people collaborated a lot. And think about the fact that it was all tied in tied to. Um, festivities like we said and 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 when we call him the fun guy uh it's real it's real that uh this is at the forefront of artistic innovation the festivities really because a lot of the things were revamped a lot of the things were repainted so you need a lot of people to like when you do any kind of um event really but when you want to everything to shimmer and to to see magnificent, you have to have lots of people who can help you with the props, but then really good artists to make like statements, right? Like Holbein, who comes and the first thing he does for Henry VIII, what is it? It's painting a view of Teruan, that city that he had captured in 1513 for the French ambassadors to see. <laughs> and be and, he, and and the and the chronicle tells us that Henry VIII started um when he was they were having the banquet the the view was behind them and he stopped uh to let them know turn around and let them know what do you think of my my and it was framed by two triumphal arches why two because he had captured two cities they had captured Teruan and Tournai but also two could be because his queen had almost captured Scotland, right? Remember, right. this is 1513. So these festivities always have political intentions behind it. So the fact that Catherine is bringing Torriñano is because she wants a lot of Spanish um, taste in the Tudor court, so people get used to it. So it's easier for her to have a Sp- Spanish match for her descendants, for her daughter Mary, or for her son, when he's born, because what he wants, when she wants, when she brings Torrigiano to make those things for the baby, is for Torrigiano to stay, really, and to work for her while that baby becomes a prince and she has to educate him. 
So that's really where all these new artists and new things are coming from, is from her, um, Catherine Morgan having this necessity because really in the far, first five years of the reign, she's in charge. This is a bomb today. <laughs> well, she was a little bit older than him too. So I'm sure that had some well, weight. <laughs> she was in charge. Everybody knows it. Right. Yeah. There is no disputing that she had I mean, a lot more control Woolsey's back then. still not in the picture. Woolsey is rising. He's rising. He's, he's out of the, the butcher shop, but he's not quite in the court. Well, he is in the court, but he's not quite yeah. next to Henry. He, he will. He will be the substitute right. of Catherine. But think about this. Henry the seventh dies in April. Henry the eighth is 17. Tall, handsome, whatever you want. 17. And he has been almost a prisoner since Arthur died. And mm -hmm. he hasn't been raised to be the heir before that. So for all we want him to be this... Um, big chunk like Holbein painted him and we talked about how that just is like a way he wanted to present himself not probably quite how he was right um he what is his first decision when his father dies mm, to execute Epson and Dudley no mm. to marry Catherine of Ireland. oh yeah duh that was duh. Duh. yes why <laughs> because she's like darling we can finally do this <laughs> And I will take England to the glory days again with you. Yeah. And he believes her because for a time they do. They do. And she's like, my father's waiting yeah. for this um, to, to help you get into this League of Cambrai because you are really the rightful king of France, not that dude over there in France. And she starts putting these um, ideas in his head that he's going to become this powerful European prince. At the same time, she has to tell her dad, um, don't treat him like a child, because Ferdinand gets to a point where he's treating him like a child, and he and she's she's the one to say, hey, hey, he he's the king, okay? He's the king and he's in charge. I'm just, like, you know, helping him out a little bit here in the, in the international front. <laughs> so really, these first artists that arrive are to... to carry on the projects that had been put aside during the War of Roses that Henry VII had restarted and that are very uh, interlinked to Tudor propaganda, really. And we can talk about a very good example of that. We've talked about the Lady Chapel, that's one. Yeah. And there's a lot of Tudor symbology in, the, in there. But another one is she is involved in the the final stages of the construction of King's College Chapel in the University of Cambridge. So we know that that was finished when she was regent. The last contract was really signed by her. And it was, it has, it was proposed by a great uh, historian of architecture in England called uh, David Watkin that it is influenced by Isabella's most important architectural project, the Monastery of San Juan de los Reyes yeah, that's in Toledo. I was going to say So that. in that sense, what really, and, and what is the influential part there is really the final stage, the stage when they're adding all the decorative work. And if you think about it, it's all Tudor symbology. What she is doing is she's helping to create an image of power for the Tudors because her son, her future son, is going to be the next king of England. And she's going to make sure he's an, a, a Renaissance prince, a European prince. Not an English monarch, but a European monarch. That's the idea she has in her head. Because in her childhood, her parents had had this idea for Spain. For the Iberian Peninsula to unify. She had that same vision. That's what, for example, happened in 1513 when she uh, basically uh, destroys the... Um, I mean, the, the the Scottish king is dead. The majority of the nobility is dead. The, I mean, it's it's yeah. it's bad. She tells Henry, I'll conquer Scotland for you like my dad conquered Navarre. So she has an idea of empire, really, in her brain. And these artists are going to help her build that because when an ambassador comes, you take him to see the tombs of your parents, they're going to be like, whoa, right? You guys are powerful people. Yeah, you, the tomb of your dad is in a corner and it has no lights on it, and you know what I mean? Because the Tudors were no. Oh, sorry for saying that, but there were no one really. So it's 
propaganda is everything. Isabella, Isabella of Castile did this. She had a very dubious right to the, to the throne. And what she did is over the course of her reign, she created a lot of propaganda to say, no, 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 I've always been powerful. I come from a powerful lineage and everything. Henry VII did the same. So, and Catherine of Aragon had seen this during her time as an ambassador in his court, in the court of Henry VII. So this is her just taking that torch and continuing wow. that, uh, building that image of the Tudors as being a European monarchy, not no. just the British or English or however you want to call it monarchy. I'm I'm amazed by what you're telling me here because I don't think I ever considered what a what a strategic and intelligent move Henry the Seventh made with the marriage alliance between his son and Spain. That's probably the best decision he made for the Tudor dynasty. I was I was thinking something evil. Can I say it? Yeah, I want you I to. I think it skips a generation. I think his <laughs> granddaughter Mary was also very smart. Uh, <laughs> well, we all know his other granddaughter was. Elizabeth. So <laughs> Henry the Seventh builds this. I mean, he makes Henry the Eighth the richest boy yeah. in Europe by the age of seventeen. He's tall, handsome, filthy rich, yeah. and he's got a powerful influential woman at his side who knows latin and there's a saying in spanish saying uh, you, if you know latin you know you know everything really because you can understand it she could understand every conversation that was going on at court and she could come and say henry did you hear what the french ambassador had to say yesterday about my my nephew or did you hear that she was there there's many accounts saying and that the king also went often to her chambers to consult with her at these times. And the Spanish ambassadors certainly came with credentials for the queen and gave the credentials to the queen before they gave them to the king in these years and times. So even with Charles V too, we this is the problem that Henry really had with Catherine is that she was extremely influential. This is why the erase of her memory is so brutal too. And you know what's the first thing that he goes for? The pomegranates, because it's such, she was very smart to choose a symbol. If you, you can't imagine how many snippets of information about Catherine of Aragon's artistic patronage I found just by reading art history books related to England in this time and finding references to Catherine of Aragon because there's a pomegranate in a choir stall, because there's a pomegranate in a manuscript because it's a pomegranate. So these pomegranates all live in my brain. Um, no, but what I'm saying <laughs> is this is what that those kind of choices represent. If you're smart and you choose, and Mary the first brings back the pomegranate. Oh, I didn't know that. Yes. She uses that as her symbol too. Huh. Why? Because the pomegranate also is a symbol used by the Spanish monarchy. When Isabella, uh, Isabel and Fernando conquered um, Granada in 1492. That's what they chose. They chose Granada, that fruit, because in Spanish, it, it's, it's the same name as the city and as that last Moorish kingdom, Granada. So oh. it's just, a, it's just it, visual. Uh, it represents visually the power of the Isabel and Fernando, really. So people will recognize that in England very well, very quickly. Oh, oh, the, oh something Spanish is here. <laughs> Her coat of arms, too. Other other symbols, like the, the castle for Castile, but castles can get a bit confusing. And the sheaf of arrows is pretty, uh, pretty good, too, because the sheaf of arrows we know is from Aragon. And it appears uh, in many places in England. Projects that she was involved in or courtiers that did things to impress her because they knew she had an affinity with the arts and that she was a patron of the arts and the humanities. And she favored that in England. And basically she educated Henry to have artistic taste. Thank goodness for her. Yeah. This is why we have the whole binds that we have. Yeah. It's all thanks to her. She's the one who enabled really the arrival of Holbein. So the reason why we have this track of all these people in the Tudor court that we can you know, we see in our brains and talk to almost is because Holbein came and 
I mean, you everybody knows that, right? This is so obvious visually. The revolution in the in the, the all these paintings, all these portraits, all these drawings, because we have a one of the Holbein books um, that was kept in the royal collection. So originally it belonged to Henry VIII. Well, now we have to ask questions like, did it belong to Henry VIII originally? <laughs> because everything is marked with the king's, um, because it, it it's in the royal collection and it's from that time and it never left the royal collection. Well, it was from Henry VIII. Was Henry VIII appropriated many things. Certainly appropriated all of Catherine of Aragon's goods when she died. Anne Boleyn took some, but Henry took, for example, most likely the desk that is still to, today in the uh, Victorian Albert Museum, decorated in the Renaissance style. Very beautiful desk uh, that was that has um, H's and K's and and sheaves of arrows and castles. Do you think that belonged originally to Henry VIII? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> It's highly unlikely. It's, it's something that says H and K, love, love, love. I love you so much. You're my husband. I love you forever. Do you think that's going to yes. be something that Henry VIII is going to be commissioning in 1526? I mean, it does. He, he is kind of uh, self-absorbed. I mean, other than the sheath of arrows and castles. <laughs> yeah, but the, this was painted by the Horn Boots. So that's the 1520s. Like, for mm. example, the miniature portrait of Henry where it says H and K. And he's clearly in it's and in, in the, the, the another one that's clearly painted around the same time. It says that he's thirty five. He was thirty five in fifteen twenty six, and the horror modes are, are painting pictures that says H and K are married and are super happy together. <laughs> so why do you think they're painting these pictures? <laughs> to send Anne Boleyn, maybe, maybe that's what they, the, maybe that's 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 where Catherine sent it. Maybe she sent it to Anne Boleyn to remind her. Who was the queen? Who the king was committed to? I'm sure she had. Um, I'm sure she sent warnings, not bad warnings, but warnings of like, look at this. Yeah. So I'm sure she sent her pictures of Mary too, because that's what she did to other ladies. We know she gave miniature portraits to Catherine Parr's mother, and Catherine Parr inherited those. Yeah. So. When um, maybe, you know, when when the ladies came back from being in the court of Margaret of Austria, like like Anne Boleyn or Claude of France, like Anne Boleyn, maybe they received these portraits so they could display that they were, you know, that they were loyal to the queen. And maybe Henry was the one to say, well, I'll sneak another one and send it to Anne Boleyn so she knows that, you know, I really want to be with her. So these these um these things are also a way to spread your own propaganda because Catherine above all was not stupid and she knew what was da going down in 1526 especially after the news come that Charles is married the portuguese cousin right. as we as we as we've talked about and then then Henry threw his tantrum why do you think she brings Hans Holbein <laughs> In a desperate attempt to save the marriage. Desperate. He she hires the two leading people in the arts and that she can find. So an artist from the north, usually the Italians, like Torrigiano had broken Michelangelo's nose. So he was like, okay, I'll leave Italy. But usually they didn't want to leave Italy. Um Da Vinci did go and serve uh, Francis at first, but there, there's uh, some exceptions, but there, it's not. They had there the best, so they wanted to stay there. In the in the north, it was easier because it was so close. I mean, really, Flanders and England are close by, and and Germany. So she brings the best, one of the best, Hans Holbein, <clears throat> and he comes from a book that she has commissioned from the best of the best, from Erasmus of Rotterdam, mm -hmm. on the very topic of marriage that we've talked about, where he references the art of a painter. So. What Catherine is trying to do here is, and why do you think Holbein paints that picture of Therouanne for the French ambassadors that are proposing a French marriage for Mary Tudor? Why do you think? That's not very diplomatic to show them the city that you captured from them. <laughs> is that, yeah, yeah, sure. Or is that a humiliation? Consider that this yeah. is 1527, two years prior. Charles V had made Francis, his prisoner, 
And Francis had, had been in Madrid for some time. Oh, I, I, I would love to see Francis the first in Madrid. <laughs> you know, when sometimes the people ask you if you could go back in time and see things, you always try to like go to the happy times that you th- no, no, I want to see Francis the first in Madrid after the Battle of Pavia, arriving to Madrid with the troops of Charles V. He must have been so scared, poor guy. <laughs> I mean, poor guy. He deserved I mean, it. Do you know what he he was one of the ones who hindered in the marriage of Catherine and Henry. He certainly said, uh, and you know, Henry was very proud and he had that ego thing. He said his wife was old, deformed. Mm-hmm. So to say that to someone who's in, you know, 35 and in the prime of his life, a guy who's starting a little bit of a midlife crisis. Yeah. And say that your wife is old and deformed. Because, you know, Francis was just Google. Or yeah, Twitter. he's gross. Make, <laughs> and make a, opinions for yourself. <laughs> I mean, could there be anyone more overrated? Right, exactly. <laughs> I know. But you were the king. You were you were attractive just because you were the king. Right. Well, obviously. And when you were a queen, you were not attractive when you were 40 and couldn't bear any more children. And kings that were, you know, kings that were old and well, they were still kings. But um, what I'm saying is, is that it, this is all a strategy, really, a political strategy. Art is linked to political strategy to a point where the Whitehall collection that I've studied, that it's first uh, documented in 1542, it's all a political statement of the battle between the Spanish monarchy and France in England. Because you have portraits of Francis the First, but then portraits of the Battle of Pavia, but then pro- portraits of of Charles V, uh, Isabel of Castile, and so on. Why are these portraits hanging with battle scenes? Because you go there and you talk to the ambassador and say, "Remember Pavia," to the French ambassador, and remember this is remember Charles. He's he's my nephew, <laughs> and you're because the Queen of Sp- of England. Catherine Varon could speak French. She could talk to the French ambassador in French. Oh, come, I'll show you my collection of paintings in, in Whitehall. I have a great painting of Pavia that you're going to love. <laughs> I love it. Your king was captured by my nephew. <laughs> I There's love even, her. There is even the only double portrait that is large in the painting collection of Henry VIII that still survives in the Royal Collection Trust to this day is a double portrait of Francis I and Catherine of Aragon's niece, Eleanor of Austria, where she is holding a symbol of power. And he's shown like, like, honestly, like, a, like he's sleazy. And there is, um, there is someone in the background who is, is thought to be Triboulet, who was this, um, jouster that was very famous in the court of francis so this is a painting mocking francis the first and kind of like putting the power in catherine of aragon's niece because she had to endure this marriage to francis he treated her horribly he treated her poorly and she did it for duty the the women in the spanish monarchy were like that so this portrait do you think henry the eighth commissioned this portrait of the niece of Catherine of Aragon taking power in France, <laughs> honestly. Uh, yeah, probably not. And France is looking sleazy. <laughs> you have to go and Google it. We'll put it in the show notes, or yes, because it's you. You let you let me know what you think about Francis after you see that portrait. I love that. This is the kind of things that you can uh, unpick when you are studying the changes in art and the people who are in in the highest uh, power uh, involved. So for the longest time, we thought that all of this was, it's always said, Cardinal Woolsey and Henry VIII. Well, Catherine of Aragon had a lot to do with this. And when later on Anne Boleyn or Catherine Pa or other women or or even Mary the I uh, does other things artistically, they're innovative. They're usually linked to these projects that Catherine started really. So it's 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 just a change from the medieval times to the Renaissance. In the case of the art and humanities, through the channel of her, because she's she's learned so much in Spain with Isabella Fernando, that she just is like, 
guys, we need a, we need a, we need to step it up a bit here in England. And she does. I think it's just amazing how my perception of Catherine of Aragon has changed since doing these episodes with you. You know, when people say rank the six queens in order of your favorite to least favorite, Catherine of Aragon was always near the bottom for me. And now I know. I'm sorry. I just I'm said just going to describe but... my face right now. It wasn't <laughs> impressed. It was a just... mix of. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. You it were was, disappointed. It was the opposite of a Stendhal moment. It was <laughs> quite the opposite, really. But now, honestly, I would say, you know, uh, she's number one for me. After everything that you have said uh, and that you guys, have taught us, <laughs> you did. You have changed me to be a huge Catherine of Aragon fan because I don't think I understood, and I'm sure I'm not the only one, what an influence she had at Tudor Court's. And how powerful she was. She was like this, this secret weapon that we didn't know about. She certainly was, and 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 I've learned a lot d doing all these two because I, I and I know we get so so worked up about it because it's it's you you talk about it and it really makes sense that that this is important for a long time when you're on your own studying these things you you kind of get that idea but. Think about this. This is something that I'm now presenting to you after many, many years of research. When I started reading these books and I was dreaming about this, dreaming that this could be true, because this is what you do really when you research. You set out with, a, with an idea that you can almost see, read through the lines in, in certain books, right? Um, I, I, I didn't even like start to think that it would be this broad, wide, incredible amazing and this ride has been incredible because it's just mind-blowing sometimes um and it's got to do a lot with the time and i think that it's also a reflection of the times we're living in a way because i think we are in a big time of change and i think the end of the 15th century and the beginning of the 16th century was such an important time but it's not very well studied in many aspects still and it can teach us so much about, for example, why do I study art uh, and culture? Because th that usually brings people together. So mm -hmm. if you, if I send you something beautiful and you love it, and you, and it's a picture of me, and I look at my best, don't you think you're gonna want someone to paint the picture of you looking your best so you can send it to your friend? When we study these things and focus on these things. Uh, we can see how uh, things, uh, places like England and Spain have exchanged beautiful things that have enriched our culture because these things then stay in royal collections that end up either um, in the Prado Museum because that's the origin of that museum. It's the royal Spanish royal collections. And that's why Mary Tudor, the painting of Mary Tudor by Anthony Moore is there, is because it was painted to send to Spain because she was going to marry the next uh, king of Spain in 1554. She was married to him, right? So this is yeah. why she was painted. Or other things that we have in the Royal Collection Trust, which is the same origin. It's, in this case, it still belongs to, to His Majesty Charles III. But these are, I can't even tell you how many of the artworks in these two collections are connected mm -hmm. and tell us so many stories about our common um, culture and, and history between well, England and Spain. Emma, seriously, we're going to have to do another episode to continue on this topic some, some way, some, sometime down the road. I know you're super busy right now. But oh, I, I am. I am. I think we're going to have to, to stop today and leave okay. the rest for another time because I'm already in shock and amazement of all I've learned today. And I know <laughs> all of us need to kind of sit back and absorb all of this amazing Catherine of Aragon information that you have been giving us. Well, yes, yes. I I'm glad you've been enjoying it. Um, I hope it, it hasn't been too much. And um, I am quite busy now, but I promise I'll be back. I'll be back soon. And the only reason why I'm quite busy is because I'm only trying to make all of this just better, you know? Yeah. So there's a lot more connections. England and Spain have a rich common tradition, culture. Uh, we share art that is incredible. And that's really what I'm focusing on now. And um, I'll be back soon with uh, some more for, for the meantime. 
Um, just enjoy these episodes that we've been talking about. Listen to them again. I think they had a lot of information. Yeah. So, you know, if you guys come up with any ideas or suggestions for the future, once I, I'm less busy, let's just leave it at that, I'll be back and, and we'll be able to talk about it. And thank you so much, Rebecca. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much for having me always and, and for always like being so curious about my work. I love it. I wow. learned a lot from you too. We love you on this show more than anything. So thank you oh, so much. And, it, you. and until we meet again. Okay. Thank you, guys. I'll be back soon, I promise. <laughs> Have a great day. Well, that concludes another episode of the Tudor's Dynasty podcast. Thank you so much for listening. If you love the show and would like to show your support, please consider becoming a patron over on Patreon. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Tudor's Dynasty. As a patron, you'll get commercial free episodes, early access, some patron exclusive content, and even discounts on upcoming webinars and lectures. Head on over to Patreon today to find out more information. And for as little as $3 a month, you can show your support. Thank you so much for listening. Until next time.